qualitative cultural sociologist who studies popular music cultures. I'm also an assistant professor of sociology at CUCA College. Thank you for this opportunity to speak with you all today. In today's talk, I'll focus on understanding the relationship between DJs and their audiences, as well as the social strategies that DJs use in order to gain cultural legitimacy in a popular music field that does not see them as musicians. As a sociologist, I'm offering a sociological approach to the study of popular music and DJing. I am treating popular music and DJing as serious subjects of academic study because I really honestly believe that popular culture matters. I believe that when we take the way that people understand themselves seriously, we can gain valuable insights into, a so into the social world around us. In particular, pop culture has the potential to reveal a great deal about the social world that we live in. So as a qualitative sociologist, I engage in methods of interviewing as well as observation of people in their everyday settings. For this project, I attended concerts and events and interviewed a wide variety of people involved in popular music making. Today, I'm offering you a sociological approach to the study of popular music in this case study of DJs as black popular music makers. For the purposes of today's study, I drew upon 30 interviews that I conducted between 2007 and 2009 in Toronto, Ontario, Canada. The interviews that I conducted were with producers, DJs, industry professionals, and other individuals that were involved in the black popular music making process. In addition to interviews, I also conducted observations as well. So some of the examples of where I conducted observations include the following events. I attended events such as Battle of the Beatmakers, where producers competed for the title of Best Producer in Canada. I attended Hip Hop Karaoke, where everyday people had the opportunity to become an MC for their three minutes of fame on stage. I attended events such as Never Forgive Action, which is a popular event that catered to quote-unquote classic hip-hop of the 80s and 90s. I also interviewed Will Strickland, the president of the Urban Music Association of Canada, and I also took a beginner's DJ class at Scratch Lab um, with DJ Grouch, who was also one of my interview respondents. All of the interviews that I conducted, as well as the observations that I recorded, inform the topic of today's talk on DJs and audiences. As a qualitative sociologist, I adopt an inductive approach to gathering data and theorizing. I allow concepts and ideas to emerge organically from the respondents themselves. In this sense, I take what black popular, musics hap m black popular music makers have to say about themselves and their craft very seriously. What I found in my interviews was that again and again, many of them discussed the role of the DJ and the relationship between DJs and their audiences in terms of this distinction between crowd pleasing on the one hand and crowd commanding on the other. Which is why today I'm posing the following question. So what's the role of the musical DJ are DJs artists or entertainers who shape or reflect the tastes of their audiences? In other words, are DJs crowd commanders who shape the tastes of the crowd? Or are DJs crowd pleasers who reflect the tastes of the crowd? By adopting an inductive or bottom-up approach to gathering data, the concepts of crowd pleasing and crowd commanding really came from the respondents themselves and the interviews that I conducted. And in today's talk, I want to discuss these two strategies of, uh, of engaging the crowd, crowd commanding on the one hand and crowd pleasing on the other in greater detail. So is the role of the DJ to command their audiences by educating them and introducing them to new music? Are they crowd commanders? Or is the role of the DJ to please their audiences by playing music that they want to hear and by entertaining them? Are they crowd pleasers? My answer to this question and the answer of many of my respondents is that you often have to do both, right? 
you must be able to command and please your audience. The skill, however, is knowing when you have to please and when you have to command. So a quick note on terminology, again, before I go any further. The case study that I present today focuses on black popular music makers in Toronto, Ontario, Canada. And as I mentioned before, as a qualitative cultural sociologist, much of the terminology that I use comes directly from my interview subjects. I use the terms that my interview subjects use to describe themselves. This is why I use the terms black popular music as well as popular music makers. In terms of black popular music, based on my interviews, black popular music includes music that was spun, created, or produced by popular music makers who drew primarily on African and African American influenced musical genres, such as rap, reggae, and R&B, though many also incorporated elements of top 40 into their musical practices. The term black popular music is used over the, co the more common marketing term of urban music because many respondents did not identify as urban artists. Indeed, many argued that the term urban was created as a way to erase the African roots of black musical forms in order to sell them to mainstream consumers, which they viewed as being mainly white consumers. So why do I use the term popular music makers? Well, I use the term popular music makers instead of artists in order to be inclusive of all of the different types of individuals involved in the popular music making process. Drawing on Howard Becker, I focus on all the individuals involved in the art world of black popular music making. Instead of only focusing on singer-songwriters or rappers, I focus on everyone involved in the process. DJs, rappers, producers, and other individuals that I spoke with. Finally, um, for some of you who may not exactly be sure what a DJ is, and there might be some folks out there, I wanted to define that term as well. So from the first record parties where people danced to records put on by a disc jockey in Leeds in the 1940s, to the discotheques in London, New York, and Paris of the 1960s, to the sounds of Northern Soul in Manchester and American Disco of the 1970s, and the rise of hip-hop culture in the 1980s, all of these music scenes contributed to the formation of what we know today as radio and club DJs. Since then, however, the role of the DJ has undergone further transformations. From great crate diggers in the past, these were people who would seek rare, um, rare records, right? They would dig through crates, to blog diggers of the present, right? Seeking the latest remixes of tracks online, the role of the DJ is in a constant state of flux. There's also a wide variety of types of DJs. You have radio DJs, club DJs, and wedding DJs. And these are not necessarily the same thing. What all of these DJs share in common, however, is that they each possess a distinct relationship with their audience. What the DJs in my sample shared in common was that they were very much influenced by hip hop culture and many of them viewed the turntable as a musical instrument. Oh, and here's a photo. This is DJ Grouch. This was my instructor for the DJ class that I took, um, and I also interviewed him as part of the study. So for the purposes of today's ta talk, drawing on my interviews with my respondents, a DJ is a musician who uses their, their turntable as an instrument. And DJs use a variety of musical techniques in their craft. Two of the most important techniques are blending and scratching. Blending is when a DJ artfully mixes two songs together, thereby creating a new song in the process. While scratching is when a DJ produces distinctive sounds by moving a vinyl record back and forth on a turntable. So you can have a better idea of what these two musical techniques of blending and scratching entail, I'm going to show a very quick clip of DJ Mel Boogie and Craig Brooklyn, two Toronto DJs who are teaming up together in this clip. So in this clip, 
um, we see that Mel Boogie and Craig Brooklyn will use both musical techniques I just talked about, blending and scratching, in their short DJ set. It's around two minutes long. In particular, um, you start off by hearing Craig, Craig Brooklyn doing a little bit of scratching, then Mel Boogie um, plays a little bit of Cardinal Official, who, by the way, is a much better N MC than Drake, for any of you out there who know what I'm talking about. Um, and then Craig Brooklyn will put on a song by, Gre Craig, uh, by Greg Nice called Put Your Drinks in the Air, and then they both play parts of Belle Biv DeVoe's classic 1990 hit, Poison. So let's have a listen to this. I played that to illustrate the two musical techniques of blending and scratching, but I also wanted to play that to show you that DJs aren't just people who, who press play and play music, right? These are people who are actively involved in creating new musical sounds, right? They're actively engaged in creating music, right? So. So, having talked a bit about what a DJ is, and having illustrated the musical techniques of blending and scratching, I want to now turn to the social techniques of reading the crowd and the strategies of crowd commanding and crowd pleasing. So the practice of reading the crowd is one of the central social techniques of DJing. Though sometimes referred to as quote unquote recognizing your audience or quote unquote listening to the crowd, this ability of knowing what types of music your audience wants to hear is considered a central technique in DJing. As Mel Boogie, who is pictured here, notes, reading the crowd involves, quote, understanding how to get the crowd going and to keep the crowd going, end quote. This technique involves looking for bodily cues, such as cheering and dancing, or listening to feedback from their listeners if they're on air to help her decide what to play, both in terms of genres and how to play it, in terms of those musical techniques I talked about, in terms of blending and scratching. So as Mel Boogie again shown here notes, reading the crowd does not come naturally, and it is something that you have to really work at, like any other skill in DJing. As an aside, Mel Boogie is the sister of Maestro Fresh Wes. And I have no idea if anyone here knows who Maestro Fresh West was, but in the 80s, he was getting us all to let our backbone slide. And he is considered an icon in hip-hop in Toronto. Okay, so she is part of hip-hop royalty. Let me just say that. Okay, so the social technique of reading the crowd, as I was mentioning, is the most important skill 
in the DJ repertoire in conjunction with the DJ's location, which I'll talk about in a moment. Reading the crowd provides DJs with the ability to choose between the different strategies that I already mentioned and which I'm about to talk about right now, crowd pleasing and crowd commanding. Reading the crowd correctly is what allows a DJ to choose which strategy, crowd commanding or crowd pleasing, should be used. And reading the crowd is central to understanding the social relationship between DJs and their audiences. So let's now turn to these two strategies of crowd commanding and crowd pleasing. It's important to note that the, the distinction between crowd commanding and crowd pleasing is one that emerged from the interview respondents themselves. So what is crowd pleasing? Well crowd pleasing consists of two things. The ability to select songs and the ability to entertain the audience. In terms of selecting, the practice of selecting involves the DJ's ability to choose songs that get the crowd moving. Not only does one have to be able to read the crowd and understand what type of music they want to hear, one must, be, uh, one must also be able to select songs that get them to dance. For Numeric, a part-time DJ and promoter, being a good DJ is based on, quote, good song selection. Someone who knows when to start a track and end a track is important but it all comes down to what song you're playing." End quote. The second, com the, the second component of crowd pleasing is entertaining. As one female DJ who wished to remain anonymous noted, the role of the DJ is to enter entertain. And as JTEC notes, the role of the DJ is to quote unquote, be a party rocker outright. These sentiments were echoed by DJ Ritz, a male club DJ and producer who had the following to say. He said, quote, the role of the DJ is not to push songs on people. As DJs, we are hired to make people dance and rock the party. I am not here to educate people. Radio and mixtapes are different. You can play stuff that you would not be able to get away with at the club. But at clubs, people want to hear music that they already know. Being a DJ is about getting people to dance, end quote. So when we take selecting and entertaining together, this is that strategy of crowd pleasing. I now want to talk about this other strategy, crowd commanding. So what is crowd commanding? Crowd commanding consists of the ability to create new tastes, to educate the audience, to exercise great technical ability, and to illustrate artistic control over your performance. I'll talk about each of these four components now. In terms of taste making, the role of the DJ is not to merely reflect the musical tastes of the crowd by reading and selecting music. The role of the DJ is to create new musical tastes. For eloquence, this means that, quote, a good DJ is a taste maker. They play songs that make you excited. They are the type of DJ who will play a track that you may not know, but you will want to know. A track that is so good that you will go up to them and ask them what song it is." End quote. Crowd commanding also involves educating. Educating the audience, which requires two things. First, you have to be educated in the history of DJing. And second, you have to s possess a solid musical knowledge. And again, this is what Eloquence had to say about this. She said, quote, I feel that it is our job as DJs to be historians and to educate people and make them stop and think. We are supposed to make people enjoy a song for its beauty, end quote. Third, Crowd commanding also involves placing emphasis on the technical aspects of DJing, right? Those musical skills that I discussed already in terms of blending and scratching. So as DJ Grouch notes, who was also the DJ that I took a, a beginner um, DJing class with, this is what he had to say about the technical side of things. He says, quote, you also need to be good at the technical side of things, such as using the turntable as an instrument, especially if you are known as a turntablist and you are performing in front of an audience because they will watch you. You could be really amazing at scratching, but if you suck at blending, then what's the point? The same goes for blending. I mean, hip-hop birthed the scratch 
and to me, only being able to blend without scratching is like having a peanut butter and jelly sandwich without the jelly." Unquote. Finally, DJ Gro um, finally, the fourth component of uh, crowd commanding is this idea of artistic control. Crowd commanding involves the ability to possess artistic control over the music that you spin. This is accomplished by one's ability to quote unquote control the crowd. Again, according to Eloquence, she says, quote, a good DJ knows how to command a crowd, end quote. And for DJ Grouch, he frames this capability in terms of, quote, someone who is able to control the party, end quote. By controlling the crowd, a good DJ is able to command the party through our, their artistic skills and artistic autonomy. For many DJs, creative control is exercised by understanding the difference between catering to the crowd versus recognizing the crowd. As more or less notes, who he was um, a rapper, producer, and DJ. He had the following to say. He said, he says, so, I guess that recognizing your audience and what they want is one thing, and catering to requests is another. The DJ is not there to cater to all of the requests of the audience, end quote. So, in summary, the social relationship between DJs and their audiences is shaped by the social technique of reading the crowd. This entails the ability of the DJ to be able to know what type of music the crowd wants to hear in order to get the crowd going. In order to get the crowd going, DJs often draw on these two strategies that I talked about. Crowd pleasing, where you select songs to entertain your audience, and crowd commanding, where you educate and create new tastes in the audience through technicality and artistic control. Yet, as a sociologist, I, I will say yet, a fundamental question remains. When should a DJ please and when should a DJ command? In other words, how do DJs know when to use each strategy? For DJs, the social skill of reading the crowd is not enough. In and of itself, it does not provide a sufficient answer to this question. So I delved deeper, and based on the responses of the black popular music makers I spoke with, I formulated the concept of location as an answer to the question of how does a DJ know when they should please, and how does a DJ know when they should command their audiences. Similar to the concept of crowd pleasing and crowd commanding, the concept of location is one that DJs formulated to a greater or lesser degree in their responses. The black popular music makers that I spoke with in many ways were theorizing themselves and their craft. And what I'll say is that based on a DJ's location within the field, they will know when to use one strategy or another. Or quite frankly, it will provide them with the opportunities to use one strategy or another. So what is location? Well, I'll say that location consists of these six dimensions that all interact with one another, which is why I have them in this graphic here. And I'm going to talk about each of them um, in greater detail right now. But they are spatial, temporal, interactional, oral, individual, and numeric. I'll address each of these briefly in the interest of time, but when taken together, these dimensions are what determine the type of strategy pleasing or commanding a DJ should use wh while they are out in the field. These strategies are what DJs use in their struggles with one another over limited resources and recognition, uh, limited money, limited prestige, and limited cultural legitimacy. In short, location matters because depending on one's location, you have greater flexibility in terms of what you can do musically and what strategies you can use. So let's begin with the spatial dimension. Here, when I'm talking about the spatial dimension, I'm asking the following question. Where is the DJ performing? Is the DJ performing on the radio, in a club, at a corporate event or community event, at a house party or a wedding? If they are performing on the radio, is it on community radio or mainstream radio? If a DJ is playing at a club, where is it located? Is it in the club district or in the suburban periphery? What is the size of the club? Is it large or small? Is the DJ at a small venue in the heart of downtown Toronto, such, you, such as what you see here at the Rivoli, which is on Queen West? 
or in a local community radio station such as CHRY, which is now where Drop and Dimes Radio is, is performed on. Or are they performing at a skating rink for parents and their children? These spatial considerations influence whether to command or please. Mainstream radio and smaller clubs, oh, mainstream radio, downtown clubs, and weddings often require that a DJ please their audience. While community radio and smaller clubs outside of the downtown core will provide a DJ with more options. Okay, the second dimension I want to talk about is temporal. When is the DJ performing? Is the DJ performing during the day for high school students? If they are performing at a club or on the radio, what time slot do they have? Prime time slots on mainstream radio require DJs to please their audiences, while late night time slots allow DJs greater flexibility and options. The third dimension is um, interactional. What type of crowd is in attendance? And this again can be tied back to reading the crowd, right? We're looking at demographics. In particular, the, the DJs that I spoke with mentioned age and gender. So according to JTEC, he had the following to say, quote, I know this is gonna sound a bit weird, but you ha basically have to read the demographics. You can gauge by age, is it a younger or older crowd? Is it mostly male or mostly female? Is it a mix of genders? And then it is really based on trial and error, end quote. So this relationship between DJs and their audiences, I would say this is a very important dimension because at its core it is interactional, right? You're trying things, you're seeing how the audience responds, at least a good DJ is doing that, right? And there's a give and take between um, the DJ and the audience. Okay, the fourth dimension that I want to talk about when we're talking about location is oral. What type of music is being played? Here we're really getting into um, sounds and the music itself. And here is a photo of Eloquence. I've already talked about her a couple of times, but this is what she had to say uh, in regards to this. Quote, you know that songs with a 4x4 four four tempo, four four tempo or 98 beats per minute will make people move. You also know that types of songs will make people think, end quote. So certain genres lend themselves to certain strategies. Is the DJ playing chart hits or underground beats, top 40 or avant-garde electronica? Is the DJ eclectic in their musical mix or are they playing music from a very specific genre? For example, is it an evening of Afrobeat? Broadly speaking, DJs who play top 40 chart hits are more likely to employ the strategy of crowd pleasing, whereas DJs who play more obscure genres are more likely to employ the strategy of crowd commanding. It doesn't map out quite so neatly, but just so you have some idea what I'm talking about. The fifth dimension when we're talking about location is individual. Here is that question of what type of a DJ are you? As I mentioned before, are you a radio DJ? club DJ or wedding DJ, right? Radio DJs have greater flexibility in terms of introducing audiences to new, mu to new music. While club DJs are expected to play the latest hits, especially if they're in a large downtown club and especially if it's during peak hours. While wedding DJs must play what their consumers want to hear. They have to cater to requests, right? Finally, the last dimension of location is this, is this numerical dimension. And here I pose two questions. How many positions does the DJ hold? And what type of positions does the DJ hold? What I want to say about this is the following. The more positions that a DJ holds, for example, you are an on-air radio personality and a well-respected club DJ, and the more prestigious the positions, the greater the flexibility you have in terms of strategy use. In particular, the more you can use the st strategy of crowd commanding because you really are seen as a tastemaker. So here, for example, with DJ starting from scratch who holds multiple influential positions in the field. He's a radio DJ for Flow 93.5 as well as Vir Virgin Radio 99.9. He is also a well-respected club DJ and producer. He's also garnered multiple accolades 
such as Toronto DJ of the Year, Radio Mix Show DJ of the Year, and Club DJ of the Year. And he's also internationally known for his diversity in skills and mixing. This will be the type of DJ who possesses greater flexibility in the use of strategies based on his dominant position in the field. Starting from scratch's location helps him succeed in this professional milieu. So I started with the question of, of what is the role of the musical DJ? Are DJs artists or entertainers who shape or reflect the tastes of their audiences? And the role of the DJ to answer this question is that they're both. They're both an artist and an entertainer by adopting the strategies of crowd commanding in terms of artistry and crowd pleasing in terms of entertainment. The use of strategies is determined by simultaneously reading the crowd as well as one's location in the field. One's location, as I already mentioned, is determined by the six dimensions of spatial, temporal, interactional, oral, individual, and numeric. But I also want to make one broader and uh, I would say more important point, which is, as I said at the start, popular culture matters. Often dismissed as lowbrow or the culture of the masses, popular culture can reveal a great deal about the social world that we live in, such as the nature of the social relationships between people. I would argue that the strategies of crowd pleasing and crowd commanding are applicable to a wide variety of social settings where people struggle over resources, recognition and prestige, and especially if they're dealing with audiences or consumers. Similarly, a modified understanding of location might also be applicable in a wide variety of social settings where social actors make decisions concerning what strategies to use and why. By taking DJs seriously, we not only learn that they are serious musicians, we learn that they are also serious social theorists. Thank you.